This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Heidi Craig of the University of Toronto. We will first have a look at Heidi's very recent book, Theater Closure and the Paradoxical Rise of English Renaissance Drama in the Civil Wars. We will also discuss other areas of Heidi's past and future scholarly work, including her contributions to research in dramatic paratext and to digital development in that area. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University, Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Hello, Heidi. Good afternoon to you. It's my morning, your afternoon. Welcome back to our little series here. It's so good to see you again. Great to see you, Tom. Thank you for having me. It was it is our pleasure. And let's get to your new book out of Cambridge University Press with a title that I have practiced because it's kind <laughs> of long. This is Theater Closure and the Paradoxical Rise of English Renaissance Drama in the Civil Wars. Now, to those of us uh, who are not schooled in this, there we are. And uh, to those of us, I didn't see you holding it up because I was uh, <laughs> I was reading it because I wanted to get the title right. Uh, those of us who are schooled in this know uh, one thing for certain that never has changed is that from in the 17th century, from 1642, at the beginning of this Civil War period, the, uh, several civil wars, uh, until 1660, that eight year period is a dead zone for English drama. And I think that was established long before we were on this earth. And it was something that no one has ever questioned. And here comes Heidi Craig, and you remind us that theater performance isn't the only way that drama survives, and in some, in some cases thrives. And you have looked at this uh, period and talked about the paradoxical rise. Now, I'm going to hand this over to you because I think this is just brilliant. It's, it's just a brilliant contribution to scholarship. And tell us a little bit about how you got into this and, and what inspired you to look at this period, this dead zone that none of us look at, right? We go up to uh, 42 and then uh, start again at 60. What inspired you? Thank you. So the project started. Um... My inclination as a Shakespearean is to be somewhat contrarian. So I'm attracted to people who um, sometimes uh, challenge the idea that Shakespeare was the greatest writer that the English language has ever produced. People like Voltaire, George Bernard Shaw, um, Robert Greene, for instance, um, and there was a bit of a rival revit there for Shaw as well. Um, but for people who you know, take, um, uh, you know, challenge the idea that Shakespeare is really the pinnacle of high culture. Um, so. Uh, in the interregnum period, the period I'm looking at between 1642 and 1660, that's really the um, sort of challenging of Shakespeare par excellence, and not only Shakespeare, but Shakespeare's contemporaries. And so really the entire um, tradition of English Renaissance drama or early modern drama, which produced some of the you know, most magnificent works of art um, that, we, that we now know and treasure, um, you know, that whole tradition was really stymied and, and um, closed down. Um, for political, but also um, you know, for cultural reasons. So the period I'm, I'm looking at, um, it really began with sort of a mystery. Um, you know, we know this uh, great tradition of English Renaissance plays that flourished from the late 16th century um, till uh, the early 1640s. Uh, and then of course we have the restoration tradition. When the theaters reopened in 1660, um, you get the resumption of drama and some really um, you know, wonderful, especially restoration comedies that we you know, know and love. Um, but my question was, what happened in this intervening 18-year period uh, when the theaters closed in 1642, uh, between that time and when they reopened in 1660? Now, the story, as you say, is typically um, the idea is that the theaters closed, so everyone stopped thinking about drama, everyone sort of forgot about the tradition, and, um, you know, the theaters closed, and that was that. Uh, and to me, this just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, censorship, given what it is, you know, psychologically, humans are drawn towards what is withheld from us. Um, when something is censored, it only makes us more interested um, and you know, more drawn to it in many ways. 
Um, so I sort of took that as my um, you know, governing principle. And it really, um, you know, when I dug into the, um, into the archive and reading the, these materials about what people were um, saying about English drama when the theaters were silent, um, it really rang true that people were thinking about drama in new ways. Um, they were printing it in new ways. Stationers were preparing it and printing it in new ways and they were performing it in different ways. And so I really think of this period as um, a key moment of not only production and consumption, but also innovation. So, so the paradoxical idea is when the theaters were closed, uh, that's when you get actually an incredible period of production and um, sort of new plays in this moment when, um, in many ways, drama was sort of old or, or dead, to use one of my book's governing metaphors. Yeah, yeah. And you've remarked on this, and I saw this years ago when I was looking through whatever catalogs, you know, whether it's the um, what Pollard and Redgrave or the Wing, you know, the old catalogs we used to thumb through. Uh, that's I was giving away uh, my age a little bit there. Uh, but I saw this. It was abundantly clear that in the period that we're talking about, if you ask somebody who what, who were the major dramatists of the old play period, we'll talk about old plays in a moment, uh, it, immediately they would have said Beaumont and Fletcher. Uh, and any any look at the publication history is Beaumont and Fletcher. And, of course, that didn't last. But I think you're kind of arguing uh, that uh, every ship ro rose with the tide. If you have a strong uh, dramatic collaboration like this with additions coming out, that uh, enhances more publication. And in this period, you show where these publications are popping up and there's this uh, nostalgia, but also there's a kind of um, growth period of of the reception of old plays. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. One play, I mean, paradox is sort of a key word for, men, for many parts of my book. Um, and one of the paradoxes is, as you said, there's this, um, you know, nostalgic um, sort of attachment to the old plays, but it's sort of expressed through this novelty, this, through this desire for novelty. So you have sort of novelty on one hand and nostalgia on the other. So in the 16th, um, in the 1640s and 1650s, you have stationers turn, turn into old plays, but plays that hadn't been printed yet. So they were at once old and new. So they were issuing these um, new editions, sort of first editions of plays that had never been pr printed before. Um, and this was very um, you know, commercially enticing, uh, especially in a period of dramatic dearth. Uh, stationers were able to offer fresh plays, new plays that no one had ever seen before. Um, and one person who was really um, you know, excellent at uh, marketing these plays was Humphrey Mosley. And he's a stationer uh, from the 17th century who's sort of key to my story. Um, and one thing he did, his sort of canny marketing move, was present um, a series of plays called New Plays. And no one had ever done this before. No one had, had ever, um, I and mean, of course, first editions had been printed, but he collected plays and presented them as new plays. Um, and it was sort of ironic because these new plays, uh, many of them had been presented uh, on stage you know, four decades prior. Um, but it really sort of speaks to the um, desire for dramatic novelty and um, not only new plays, but also the sort of creation of drama and the sort of excitement of, of new um, new creations on stage. Um, so, so Humphrey Mosley and his contemporaries really tapped into that um, by sort of putting together, um, you know, old and new in this way. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I know you've been working on you on this for years, but uh, in a way, this speaks to how we uh, collectively uh, create uh, this idea of periodization, right? post-World War II period or the Prohibition period. I, I kept thinking there's not, not a great analogy there, but yes, being drawn to that which you cannot have uh, and things going underground, uh, the um, in, you know, antebellum period, uh, the before and after periods, and clearly in our minds, there was the old period before the wars and then you know, what happened afterwards when uh, Charles II came back uh, and was restored. Um, and you indicate that this periodization developed pretty much almost right on spot there. It's not one of our recreations of that. They, there was a real feeling of uh, an end of an era. Yes, precisely. Um, so you have the sense of the 16, early 1640s as this real watershed moment. I and mean, part of it is just the fact of the Civil War, all the physical destruction that was happening, you know, cathedrals, their windows were being smashed and icons are being uh, smashed. So there was a real sense of 
sort of a physical break from the past and also um, a cultural break from the past. So the closure of the theaters um, was felt um, perhaps not immediately, but pretty soon after as, as a significant loss. Um, you know, so sometimes the theater closures of 1642 are compared with the earlier plague closures, um, and there is some credence to that comparison. So, as you know, um, when the commercial theaters were open starting in the late 16, um, you know, in the late 1600s, the theaters were periodically cl closed for outbreaks of plague um, and periods of national mourning. And sometimes this would extend for months or even years at a time. You have plague closures lasting sometimes 18 months. Um, so some people. You know, when the theaters closed in 1642 due to the war, there was a sense that, um, you know, among practitioners and, and audiences of, okay, we've been here before, the theaters were, were clo closed, and they may remain closed for months or, you know, maybe years, but they'll eventually reopen. Um, so there was a sense of, you know, you had people complaining, actors complaining um, in print about the loss of their livelihoods and, you know, requesting that the theaters be reopened. But there was always this sort of expectation that the theaters would eventually reopen. And so in the first sort of five year period, you have, um, you know, people are writing, they sort of have it two ways. They can sort of paradoxically like, oh, our livelihoods are gone and everything's destroyed. But, you know, on the other hand, if the theaters we, where we can reopen, we can, um, you know, can, we can get back to what we were doing. And the illegal performances of the late 1640s, um, you know, were performed by, um, you know, professional actors. So they were sort of, you know, a lot of them were sort of standing at the ready to, to resume drama if the theaters um, were reopened. Um, but around 1647, uh, there was a change both politically, so um, you have uh, you know, Charles, Charles I um, and um, the whole Putney debacle, um, so where, where it's clear that um, you know, Parliament and Charles really won't be able to um, you know, reach an agreement and you know, anything that, um, you know, any hope of um, Charles, you know, a government where Charles is installed at, um, as the monarch, um, that's clear that that really won't, won't be happening. So you get this sort of breakdown um, in political discourse, uh, and that's accompanied by a sort of clear breakdown in cultural discourse where, um, you know, Charles won't be coming back to the throne. The theaters, um, even if they were to reopen, things were just so far gone that, um, you know, things would be different even if they did reopen. So, you know, it's sort of after the first five years, you get a sense that, um, you know, you get a sense that 1642 really is a, a line in the sand. Uh, and there, and then, as you said, they get a sense of periodization. So it's happening not precisely in real time, but you know, pretty pretty quickly after the theaters closed, people realize, oh, this is a um, you know, epoch defining um, uh, activity or an epoch defining moment. Yeah, I think we feel a, a sense of that now, a, a, a pre COVID and post COVID, uh, in, in a much smaller time frame. You know, we we have to remember eighteen years. You know, 18 years is a long time uh, when you think of where you were 18 years ago. And with, in the case of my students, they were barely here. Uh, and it's a long time for things to go down. Now, you do point out that there were uh, drolls, uh, the uh, small dramas that uh, kind of, uh, well, closeted, uh, you know, that people couldn't stop acting, you know, but uh and there's there's quite a good bit of evidence or a lot of things that survived that uh, these drolls in print, right? Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So drolls are part of the uh, illegal performance tradition that arose um, in response to the prohibition. Um, and so there's two sort of um, sort of phenomena that are worth describing. So you have the drolls, which are short uh, playlets. Usually, um, usually they're drawn for longer from longer plays. So you'll have a short extract from. Henry the Fourth, or plays from Beaumont and Fletcher, um, and they're usually comic, and they'll be, you know, sort of a few minutes long, and they they usually um, stage the favorite favorite comic scenes from um, from well known plays. So a, a good example is the drool from Henry the Fourth, the robbers robbed, or the bouncing knight, is essentially all of Falstaff scenes, um, sort of taken out from Henry the Fourth, um, Henry the Fourth Part One, and just sort of put together. Now these drools often don't make a lot of sense. They sort of depend on a sort of folkloric knowledge of Falstaff, or um, in some cases, you just like Falstaff, so you want to see him on stage, even if the plot doesn't make much sense, because they just sort of, the context is, is really been removed. Um, yeah. So you have the drolls, and the droll as a form sort of emerges in response to the, uh, the raids on drama. So that's the other thing that's sort of important to know about uh, performance in this period. So when people would perform uh, plays in, in London, usually, but also other places, there was always the threat for uh, government raids by the local um, by the local authorities, and these soldiers would go in um, and bust up the performance. Um, the money would be confiscated from the from the ticket sales, and 
you know, more devastatingly, the, the costumes would be seized. Um, and so it's interesting because our best knowledge of clandestine performance is actually due to these records of raids happening on performance. Because mm. if, the, if the performances were, you know, if everything went off as planned, you wouldn't really know about them because they're clandestine. Um, so the raids is when we, we sort of hear about uh, what went wrong. And we have um, in one story, there's a performance of a play where the player had a king on, uh, had a crown on his head. He was a player king. And when they, um, you know, the cops come in and bust up the performance and they take, they take the player king crown, they'll take turns, you know, trying it on. And, and so during a moment when, you know, the monarchy itself is, um, you know, is that issue, that's a very sort of symbolic, symbolic moment. Um, and since costumes are so expensive, the fact that, um, you know, the, the authorities would seize the costumes, it was very devastating for the actors. So the droll emerged partly in response to the threat of raids, the idea being you can get up, perform a play uh, or play let very quickly, and then just get out with your money and your costumes intact. Um, so this sort of short form was a less risky way to to perform. Yeah. Uh, so you just can't kill it off. Uh, it's basically it. Uh, you you can uh, you can make it go underground. I guess some of the uh, soldiers who were raiding probably were in attendance at a performance. You know, it's just okay, boys. We got to go in and hit this. It would be a little bit uh, again that uh, false analogy I'm making between prohibition. You know, the the idea that the you know the mayor's in the speakeasy drinking with the boys until you know the word comes down that he's got to close the place down. So they make a big public exhibition. You could see maybe something like. Like this what a dramatic moment right it is it you know, is it busting is. up now, that's a play not within a play that's a play without a play you know the, that's right oh that's yeah. a good <laughs> that's a good title <laughs> oh, i should have yeah. that should have been my uh, title of my book tom no 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 <laughs> because no <laughs> you're, you're, at least. you're so uh textually oriented and this was the next thing i wanted to get to here was the fact that the value of reading uh I think you, there's an indication here that it goes up. There is a uh, the idea of the old play now as a relic, as something to preserve. Uh, whereas they, you know, well, we did have big uh, folio, of course, editions of Shakespeare and Johnson and Beaumont and Fletcher, but uh, still, I think there was a struggle uh, trying to figure out what were the value of these play text. Now, because they're not these unified uh, poetic thing, they're not Milton, they're not Paradise Lost, and they're not uh, Fairy Queen, whatever. They're these uh, uh, basically uh, movie scripts that are out there. Um, and uh, there's, I think, I, I, I've, I've received from reading your book that there, there is this value of, of reading drama, the the uh, activity of reading drama and uh, a dramatic uh, drama appreciation. So it is, in a sense, sort of a precursor to our our field. You know, many well, a couple of centuries later. Yes, that's what I would argue. Um, so I mean, the question of when plays went from trivial, ephemeral entertainments to literature is something that our field is really interested in. There's a few different moments. You know, the folio publication of Shakespeare in 1623 seems to be a moment when Shakespeare is presented not just as a sort of playwright who does entertainments, but a serious poet who's writing dramatic poetry that will last for posterity and is really sort of, is literary. Um, so that is an important moment. But I think that um, Shakespeare is sort of an exception to, um, you know, to the period you have, and Ben Jonson might be another one. For the most part, the plays produced for the commercial theater are seen as know, light summer stuff to borrow a, um, a line from, from one of my paratexts. Um, so some of them are great, but um, you know, some of the, the plays and some of the playwrights are um, literary, but most of them are poor, um, you know, more entertaining. But I would say that this is a moment um, in the 1640s and 50s that uh, drama as a genre, English Renaissance drama as a genre, um, is both sort of coalesces as a genre, so you can think of it as you know, one thing, that's something we call now English Renaissance drama, so sort of this, this thing that sort of coalesces uh, is elevated as a whole. So even people who you might not think as particularly serious, um, you know, Thomas Haywood or, um, you know, people who are sort of write off plays, you know, hundreds of plays um, in one sitting, um, they too are sort of elevated. As you said, sort of a, rising, a rising tide elevates all boats. Um, they are too elevated as part of this, uh, belonging to this corpus of um, English Renaissance drama where you have, you, know, you think of, um, it's in this point where you think of sort of Shakespeare, Johnson and other figures as belonging to one. Um, sort of one coherent uh, category. Yeah. And also commercially viable. 
this would not have happened. These guys are not uh, the university presses putting out, you know, scholarship uh, that's publicly funded. You got to uh, you got to pay the um, the you have to pay the rent uh, if you're a printer. And so for a printer to move over and to do this amount of printing during this period indicates that these are very commercially viable. Yes, it's sort of it's interesting. It's a period of canonization, but also of commercial production. I think, and then think they go in. You know, sometimes we think of them sort of separately today. We have high art on one side, and then you know, popular, um, economically viable uh, texts on the other side. But I think this is a really a period where uh, those things dovetail, partly because the stationers who um, you know wanted to make money, of course, but they also saw themselves as um, you know the guardians of high culture um, in in a time where um, you know it was very directly being. Uh, attacked by by the authorities, so the stationers wanted to preserve what they saw as high art, but they also wanted to to make money. And, and Humphrey Mosley again is a key figure in that. He was a great reader. He actually printed Milton, funnily enough, even though Milton was, um, you know, his political views didn't ally with Mosley's own royalist views. Um, but Mosley was a great reader, and he, um, you know, he knew what would be uh, what would be what would sell, and also what was beautiful. So it's interesting, you know, with some of these key figures really uh, we have to thank for. Um, printing these texts that we still have them to enjoy today. Yeah. And I, I, I think, uh, it's, it's a hard argument for, uh, to make. I've been making it throughout my career. But if you don't have this period of reception afterwards, obviously it dies, it goes away and uh, it falls into somebody's basement or attic, uh, whatever the whatever was printed, or maybe it isn't printed. You know, there's so many people who have lived and died who may have, we may remember as a great artist, you know, but it just, that never happened. And so the, these, these old plays, 18 years is long enough to kill off. And, that, and that's what they, uh, the Puritans wanted to do. They would have been perfectly happy to have uh, had this whole thing erased from, you know, in sort of Maoist fashion from history. Uh, but apparently they did not go after the printers. They just went after that physical space. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, this is, again, this is, um, people have various uh, thoughts about this idea. Some people would argue that the whole um, sort of uh, argument that the Puritans really had it in for drama, really targeting drama, is actually um, sort of not entirely true. Um, I mean, I would argue, uh, Susan Wiseman makes this uh, argument in um, in her book, uh, Drama, uh, Drama and the Civil War from 1997, who's one of the great, uh, Susan Wiseman is a great um, person whose work I draw on, Emma DePledge is another person, uh, Rachel Willey, uh, these are the, these are people who've written, um, I'm not, you know, I didn't come up with this idea of working, looking at the 1640s and 50s, um, you know, I'm certainly drawing, uh, drawing on lots of excellent work, uh, but Susan Wiseman makes this argument that um, where it's perhaps right to say that uh, the closure of the theaters in 1642 was more pragmatic than political, uh, it became a political campaign uh, as as time went on, um, because there wasn't only one um, ordinance. There was an ordinance of 1642 banning the theaters, but it was reissued several times. And the one that was reissued in 1647, for instance, made it very clear that plays were not to be tolerated because they provoked God's wrath. And so there you, it's very clear that um, where in 1642 it was a temporary injunction against plays only while the war was on, by 1647, um, you know, the people who were issuing these decrees, and, and they were you know, Puritans, um, they wanted to end drama forever, um, you know, way female. Um, so it is, um, even though sometimes the whole idea of a royalist, you know, the drama loving royalist on one hand and the drama hating Puritan on the other hand, there is some more complexity to that. But generally speaking, I think that, um, you know, you may have had individual Puritans who liked drama, but I think generally speaking, the sort of Puritan ethos, um, you know, was, uh, very suspicious of drama. So I think that's that sort of those broad co contours are are still true, even given the exceptions. Yeah, yeah. And even with the um, the naming of people as Puritan, uh, there's a uh, there's a problem there. You know, at what point does someone become a Puritan? You know, there are clear examples of people who uh, just apparently <laughs> didn't want anybody else to have any fun. Uh, kind of our modern uh, understanding, but there were people who were, uh, you know, there were uh, you, you know men of the cloth uh, who were very serious, and they they felt that you know this probably wasn't the best thing for society, and you know wouldn't vote against something like this but probably they privately enjoyed 
uh, any number of things, you know, in terms of uh, their own personal entertainment. But then you have to think of the, the good of the commonweal and, and that sort of thing and where we're going. So it's so complex. That period is so complex uh, historically. Yes, and it's not just plays. I mean, uh, you know, the, the government tried to ban uh, Christmas celebrations, tried to ban, um, you know, drinking on Sunday or drinking altogether. Um, you know, Morris dancing sports on Sunday. So there was, you know, there's a lot of things you can, banning, you know, banning Christmas. That sounds, that's like what the, you know, the Puritans and the Grinch have something in common. But um, yeah. you know, and it really was, um, you know, if you do think of, even though, you know, given the, the complexity of, um, you know, it's, it's sort of an oversimplification to say the Puritans were opposed to, to fun. Um, in practice, you know, the, the, the ordinances they issued were, um, you know, we're certainly um, opposed to many things that we think of you know, people having having a good time. <laughs> yeah, well, that came uh, to the uh, to North America, uh, and uh, I think I'm right in my uh, history of uh, Christmas in North America. It was not a big deal for the uh, settlers, the early uh, Puritan settlers in the Northeast. And I think it was the um, the German immigrations, and then the Germans were going to have their Christmas. And that was more, you know, moving out to the Midwest. And then, of course, uh, the, um, the department stores and so forth, people found out how much money you could make off of Christmas, you know, a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, the abolishment of Christmas, anything, uh, this whole uh, lack of mirth, uh, the part of part of um, social, but individual and social consciousness that you have this spectrum of people who have too much fun. Obviously, you know they're they're drinking too much. They're they're uh, raising too much hell. Uh, and yes, this is not good for society. I think we all agree. And then you go all the way to the other end. Let's just sit around and think about. God and work and and do you know nothing anything fun is suspicious right and as well, I think a, you're saying is that most of us e exist somewhere uh, in the middle of that spectrum perhaps. It's funny you say that Tom because Francis Rouse, one of the people who crafted the um, original ordinance of 1642, which banned the theaters, he suggested replacing the theater with fasting. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, that doesn't. Uh, oh, that sounds yeah. like fair trade um so you could you know that really sort of speaks to it's, a, it's sort of a, a quite dramatic example of yeah um, let's go out on friday <laughs> night and fast together right you know what fun. Uh, <laughs> but uh it, you see it now this whole thing carries up in, uh, until our time and i think that what the the kind of work that you are have done here and that you continue to do shows us and reminds us that what what is normally in our time kind of received as this high, maybe academic art or high art or, um, mm, you know, uh, above the um, the non-elite, you know, uh, better than. Our, th most of this stuff was right there in society, enjoyed by people uh, on, you know, from, you know, co uh, common workers to uh, the elite and so forth, that this was general entertainment. And uh, the big problem was that it wasn't seen as high art right off the bat. It had to work its way through a reception period that you've covered so wonderfully. Uh, and it, it could have been lost, but we are in our universities and our university positions and so forth, uh, still from generation to generation trying to keep this in play because we see the continuity here. There's something valuable here that uh, needs to remain in play. You're absolutely right, Tom. And I think one, one reason why I think this is a key moment uh, for what we do today as scholars is that in the 1640s and 50s, you get, people get the awareness that, um, you know, whereas previously they can sort of count on going to the theater, they can count on going to a play, um, you know, they didn't have to have a printed play in their hands to be able to enjoy drama. When the theaters close, they really have this awareness that if I want to in, you know, enjoy these plays, for these plays not to fall into oblivion, um, they really have to be printed. Because previously, um, and, and that makes sense to us now. But previously, there wasn't a sense that if the play is not printed, it will disappear forever, because there's always the chance that it could be performed again on stage. Mm -hmm. But without the stage uh, being a viable option, it really has to be printed. Um, and in that case, I mean, the, you know, the, the sort of common person didn't enjoy these plays. Um, but once plays are, um, you know, legally um, in the exclusive realm of, of print, 
you do get people looking at the sort of silver lining of this moment well, uh, where they say, oh, you no longer have vulgar uh, people uh, as audience as audiences for your plays because only the literate people can read your plays. So this was, um, you know, people sort of presented this as a way of um, sort of elevating the drama um, insofar as the audience was now exclusively literate. Um, now, I think, um, you know, that's, um, you know, I, I do think that also thinking about our own moment, um, you know, one thing that really, um, uh, something that sort of resonated with the with my book sort of unexpectedly was um, the connection between COVID and, uh, and, and the, the theater closures. So I wrote this, this book emerges from my dissertation, which I finished in 2017. So I'd been thinking about it long before COVID, um, but, um, you know, in this, in, in, during COVID, you know, the theaters closed, public entertainments had to close, actors were suddenly put out of work, people had to sort of scramble and figure out what to do. Um, and one, thing, one, thing, one sort of story people would tell about performance um, or about the performance during the interregnum period, my period, um, is that, oh, well, there was a legal performance, so, you know, things weren't too bad because people could perform legally and they sort of eked out a living. Now, that is true, but what, one thing COVID was um, sort of brought to light was um, you know, similarly, people would put plays on Zoom or, you know, have alternate forms of um, presenting the theater, but it really was devastating for the practitioners. You know, a Zoom play didn't attract the same type of audience or the same revenue as a play on the stage. Um, so likewise, you know, in, in our own COVID time and then during the interregnum, um, just a the simple fact of banning theater really had, um, you know, immediate um, you know, concrete consequences that sort of resonated throughout, throughout the throughout the, in the following years. Um, and again, too, you know, in COVID, it may, may have been, I mean, we're still in, COVID is still uh, an issue, but, you know, for sort of 18 months or two years when it was really, you know, really devastating to theater, uh, imagine 18 years, right? Yeah. That would be, um, yeah. you know, the culture imagine. tradition sort of be obliterated. And people who were, um, you know, one thing I talk about in my book is the sense of continuity. Um, you, go from, you go from Richard Burbage to uh, John, John Lowen, for instance, and, and sort of the successors of, there's always someone else to pick up the baton. But after, yeah. after 1642, you get the sense of uh, sort of a dead end. And I think that's, um, that's sort of one reason why we're attracted to these plays, why people were attracted to the plays in the 1640s was the sense of a dead end um, and the sense of if we're not going to let these plays fall into oblivion, uh, we really need to do something. We need to make a concerted effort to print them, to preserve them, to read them, to think about them carefully. And so, and so that's why I think um, you know what's happening in the 1640s and 50s is important for what we're doing now, today, in 2023, um, the sense of, um, you know, these, we can't access them on stage anymore. So we need to read them carefully and really um, so, sort of first preserve them physically and then read them carefully. Because um, one argument I make in my book is that we have a lot in common with people in the 1640s, because in 2023, we can't see a play as it was staged in the early 17th century. And in the 1640s, that wasn't true either. Um, you know, immediately that sort of tradition was 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 cut off and was at a remove from from people in the um, in the mid 17th century. So that's, you know, the first sort of the moment of the, the, the scholar of early modern drama having to access the plays primarily through textual means um, that really starts in the 1640s. So they, those people are our are, are predecessors. Yeah, well, we can return to this, but I'm seeing a segue right now. Uh, and let's see if I can get this ship into harbor. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're dealing with a uh, nostalgic uh, attachment to the the prior age in in the age that you're considering the the civil wars you know with all of that uh, uh disruptive stuff going on all over the place i mean real violence and real um uh, just mayhem in in uh, uh as these factions tried to get things sorted and you know reach a settlement or whatnot and uh at at this at the time of all of this destruction even more you know, destruction of uh, relics and holy uh, areas. And so just terrible stuff all the way around. In the middle of all of this, you have this uh, burgeoning publishing industry uh, that is doing something that it hadn't done before, right? Now, I'm making the uh, uh, comparison again with COVID that as we had to close down, now the poor actors, uh, people who stand up comics, people in entertainment who required studio and studio audiences, you know, all of those people were hit so hard. Yet 
if I'd contacted Heidi Craig in 2017 to ask about her research at that point and said, let's, uh, let's zoom. You said, what is this guy? You know, right. I think, I think Tom has, you know, got into some mushrooms or something in his backyard. <laughs> I've never heard of this. What in the world? Oh, and we're going to sit here and talk like we're talking now that normalize that. So we're fine. We're fine with it now. And so there was that, that there's the, um, uh, there's the birth of these things in the middle of the death of so much other stuff. Um, now I don't want to make a Phoenix image here. You know, that's, that's a complete, it's a completely different thing, but it's a quarter. I guess what we call it is the un, unexpected outcome or unintended outcome. There was no intention in COVID. It was just a virus. Uh, there was a great amount of, of intentionality in the um, uh, Puritan movement uh, in, you know, the period you're dealing with, but uh, even before COVID, you and I both saw the value of uh, preservation and uh, bibliographical cataloging, the boring stuff, the stuff that puts people to sleep. If they ask you at a cocktail party <laughs> what you do, uh, we were both drawn to digital digital means because it's so abundantly clear that when you're dealing with bibliography, dealing with cataloging, that the uh, ability to search digitally just beats all right these big catalogs that you used to well you still do see uh, all over the place where you'd have to pull down if you're a lawyer you have to go to the statutes of the state of new mexico and pull down 1949 and you know zip through and you'd hire people to do that for you and now you can just bring it up you know and pretty soon even now there's going to be a, a very uh, directed ai that can get, they pull that you know do all of uh, this stuff for you and you are doing digital projects. And that's what I want to do is get into your digital projects. We can return, but uh, you are working with two in particular, and I'm going to hand this to you. There's some acronyms here. I don't want to mess up. Okay, thank you. Yes, so my project, which I'm co-creating with Sonia Masai, is MDIP, that's the acronym, which stands for Early Modern Dramatic Paratexts. Mm -hmm. And it focuses on paratexts, which were printed in English drama uh, from the first days of printed drama, so about 1515, to the closure of the theaters in 1642, or to the closure of the theaters and then the reopening of the theaters. It's the original book, I actually have it here. Excuse me. So this is the um, the original uh, paratext in English printed drama edited by uh, Sonia Masai and the late, great Thomas L. Berger. Yeah. So um, this book is a printed reference book, and it's two volume. I have um, the other volume on my shelf here. This is includes transcriptions of all paratexts, so things that surround the drama, uh, dedicatory poems, uh, cast lists, dedications, commendatory poems, uh, errata, um, and anything that sort of frames the play that isn't the play itself. Um, so they, in this two-volume reference work, they printed all uh, all the paratexts for plays printed to the closure of the theater, 1642. So that's important, an important date. Um, so when Sonia and Tom were working on this project um, to present paratext, which tell you a lot about the production of plays on stage, uh, the production of plays in print, ideas about performance, ideas about um, you know, the content of the plays. They're very rich. Uh, it's a rich, rich repository of information, which was more or less untapped until Sonia and Tom uh, published this book in 2014 with Cambridge University Press. Um, yeah. So when they were creating this um, this reference resource, they decided to end in 1642 because they felt that the intervening period between 1642 and 1660 really represented a different body of material that was re reflecting on the closure of the theater. So they sort of put a pin in 1642 and said it will be for someone else to, you know, to uh, something else, someone else to take up, um, you know, pick up the baton. So this is where I came in um, when I was working on my uh, originally my dissertation out of which my book emerged. I was really interested in the paratextual materials printed after 1642 uh, to 1660. So paratexts in printed drama, uh, printed in the period of the theater closures, which reflect on the theater closures and reflect on you know, any number of things, but weren't in this reference book. So for my own purposes, with for an independent study, I thought, oh, I'll just do the follow-up edition uh, for my own um, independent study, um, thinking, oh, how long, you know, how long would it could it take me? How many could there be? A thousand pages later of transcription of paratext. Um, using also, I mean, I use a lot of, um, I was in the archive, but I also used English, early English books online, which is an incredible resource. Um, I had this entire corpus of all paratexts in printed drama, 
um, of, between plays printed between 1642 when the theaters closed and 1660 when the theaters reopened. Um, so I had this project and I got in touch with uh, Sonia Masai, one of the editors of um, Paratext and English Printed Drama 1642. And we decided to join forces um, and our goals were twofold. First, to digitize these two these two reference books, which are, you know, really um, an incredible work of research, um, but in many ways um, are sort of designed for the digital format, even though they're in print. So, um, you know, this book, it has an index, but it's not keyword searchable. So if, if the index you're reading doesn't have, um, you know, the keyword you're interested in, it might not be entirely useful. Whereas uh, a digital project is dynamic, fully searchable, so you can search, you know, anything you want. If it's in the corpus of transcriptions, it will appear. Um, so our first goal was to digitize these two volumes into a very user-friendly, intuitive, open access digital database. And that's what we did um, in collaboration with the Bolger Shakespeare Library, who helped um, design the website, and the Center of Digital Humanities Re Research at Texas A&M, which also did a lot to, um, to uh, design the website as well. Working with this large digital team, and digital projects are always highly co collaborative, we launched um, early modern dramatic paratexts um, you know, last year. Um, so that phase one was to add all of the paratexts and associated metadata uh, for the playbooks in which they appear, that appear in this two volume uh, reference work. And you can see there's a lot here and there, um, you know, there's a lot of content. So it's really, even just having this digitized is, um, is very useful for the, um, for the academic, um, you know, for, our, for the academic world. Um, phase two was to add the material from my own project, which is paratexts from 16, 1642, to 1660. Um, so these um, these materials previously weren't available, um, not in a in a modern reference edition. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sonia and I, by joining forces, we digitized the existing books and then added my material. So we're in the process of adding materials. Um, we're now in beta, um, which means the site is available for people to play around with. Um, it's not perfect. Um, beta is not you know not the true blue launch, um, but it is the, the corpus of materials is there for people to. Um, you know, to experiment with. What we're hoping by launching it in beta, even with its sort of warts and all, um, is that people will use it, tell us um, you know, what they like, what they don't like, what they wish was available so that we could you know, tinker with the functionalities. So if you want to search for, um, you know, currently you can search by paratext type, you can search by keyword, you can search by date, you can search by author, but there may be things that we're not considering that people would like. So they can email us and say, oh, we would like to search by you know, something else. Um, so at this point, we're still uh, pretty flexible. Um, and another other exciting news is that uh, the Paratext project, which was developed and hosted, as I said, by the Folger, is now joining forces with Lendo, which is the linked uh, early modern drama online, which is hosted at the University of Victoria, led yeah. by Janelle Genstad and, you know, again, a wonderful team uh, um, of collaborators. So we're going to be integrated into uh, the Lendo suite of projects, um, and that is sort of in, in process right now. So that will be um, the MDIP, our project will be fully TEI encoded. Um, which we're in the process of doing, which will make it much more sort of functional and interoperable with with other sites, including the plays uh, on the Lendo, Lendo suite of um, yeah. texts. Now, by TEI, that's Text Encoding Initiative, is a longstanding way to encode or to present, to frame text digitally. And the digital humanities community has uh, gravitated into this as the uh, superior form and the uh, what we're going to be using uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now, uh, very, in other words, not a, what did Janelle call it? Uh, this is Janelle Genstad of uh, Victoria, uh, boutique, these boutique programs that afflicted a couple of projects uh, some, some years back, and that now with changes in highly technical language, but basically uh, <laughs> it's just uh, old old parts to an old car, right? Don't fit the new car, I think is the way it's best, you know, uh, and you need to design things in which you can move forward. And it, the uh, TEI is flexible enough to to go with the, the new waves of programming that come in uh, generation to generation, which is um, a generation in, in this business can be the three to five years. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's good. And you're, you're going to be part of the, uh, overarching Lemdo, uh, project at UVic, uh, and that hosted on their server. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And one great thing. So Lemdo is a longstanding project, uh, and they have, uh, critical editions of 
plays by Shakespeare, but also plays that aren't also um, readily available. So sort of less, um, less traditionally popular plays. So plays that people want to read, but can't find an edition of easily. Um, so one great thing, um, you know, obviously it's, it's great to make these plays available. Um, and one um, nice thing about us from the perspective of paratext is that they chose to exclude the paratextual material, um, partly because they were aware that Sonia and I were working on this project. So they thought we would eventually join forces. Um, but now it won't be a matter of a link to our project. The project will actually be fully integrated in the Lemdo suite. So you can go you know, see, the, see the paratext for uh, the Jew of Malta, uh, and then you can read the Jew of Malta itself. Um, and so- Yes, yes, excellent. And this is all open access. Uh, the, yes. Um, so, you know, these those big books that you're showing us and, you know, the academic books can uh, be uh, out, price the um <laughs> you know mere mortals uh i i think when i see some of these just astounding prices on academic books uh where you know, well of course they're marketing to libraries who have the funds to bring you know the books in but you know a lot of our uh, viewers and listeners don't we have uh lay people out there who are just interested in this stuff and if you're not close to a big university library it's kind of hard to get uh, to this uh, material and these open access online uh, sites, uh, I yes, I think most of us would say we like holding a little book in our hand and reading it. Uh, but I I had to work quick to get uh, access to Heidi Craig's new book, and I was glad that there's the Kindle option while I wait on the hard copy, right? And so yes, if you, it's hard to find uh, editions sometimes of the Jew of Malta in hard copy. And and great that that can be accessed and searched. Yes, it is. It's a good, um, you know, access is really important for digital projects. You know, economic access, you can't afford a, you know, $150 book, uh, but also access in terms of expertise. So some of these reference books require a fair bit of prior knowledge to be able to just sort of parse, um, you know, for instance, um, in this book, space was quite a consideration. So there's a footnote that with a series of dates and information that, you might not realize the first date is the publication date and the second date is the performance date and the third number is the STC number and so forth. Um, so that requires a fair bit of expert knowledge um, and it's just a, the considerations of space. Um, but when, um, um, you know, I can, I'll pull up, uh, pull up uh, an image of our, of our site. Um, a nice thing about the digital format is that we have you know, all the space we want essentially. So whereas previously you had dates where you might not show, know what corresponds to what, um, our metadata is presented very clearly so you can see, oh, this is the author, this is the date of publication, this is the date of performance, this is the Greg number, this is the uh, deep number, and everything's presented very clearly so that you don't have to be an expert researcher to be able to understand, um, you know, understand what these things are. So that's another thing. The di digital format is both um, you know, economically accessible insofar as it's open access, and then mm -hmm. it's just sort of, um, you know, people who are um, not especially seasoned researchers yet can also understand um, understand what these materials are. Janelle Jenstad talked to, uh, with me about the, the notion, what you want, what you want is a site that you can put on a USB, <laughs> you know, if necessary. Uh, and, uh, and, and that it has that functionality within, within itself, right? That it isn't so tied up with uh, knocking itself off this server, that server or whatever, so dependent on so many other things being up and running. And I think that's the way you guys are proceeding too. If you That's that's a really good point. I mean, one thing, um, you know, printed books, I mean, I like printed books, having them in my hand, but another nice thing about print is that I put this on my shelf and tomorrow it will still be there. And, you know, 25 years from now, it will still be there. Yep. Um, but with digital projects, um, you know, that's less assured and you never know, you know, there's various things that could happen. Um, you know, software is updated or, you know, what have you, servers go down and projects can disappear. And I, for, I forget what the exact statistic is, but, you know, the number of projects, digital projects that were curated 10 years ago, you know, a fraction of them still exist, of DH projects. And that is, you know, represents a lot of knowledge, a lot of labor that is just lost. And one thing Janelle Jens that is really, um, you know, really her important work she's doing is that projects are endings compliant. So projects that, um, you know, even if, sort of the framework of the project is no longer um, extant, the data can be preserved uh, forever, much like a printed book will, you know, barring floods or fires or moths, um, you know, the printed book will, will 
exist forever, essentially. Um, yeah. So for, for the data, for, for a project to be endings compliant, and Janelle is really the expert on this, um, you know, ensuring that digital projects can be you know, put on a USB key or saved um, you know, in some format such that no matter what happens, um, you know, the data will, will exist um, you know, in perpetuity. And she's really um, you know, doing, this, doing this, this work, and it's really important work. Especially yeah. as we all start to work, turn to digital projects, we don't want our work to to disappear. Well, that's what we've worked on this uh, with the little project that we're doing at my university to digitize rare Bibles that we hold. And not a huge collection, but some very fine editions in there that nobody knows anything about. Uh, I was here for uh, 10 years uh, and just didn't know that we had these in our library and there was it brought them out for an exhibition and i went downstairs uh, we have a chapel downstairs and it was in the foyer of the chapel where uh, the bibles and some other religious texts from uh 16th mostly 16th 17th century well, where did these come from so our library right across the way you know we have special collections and so that uh, we began you know digitizing them however just i'm making a, a short story long the uh the thing is this year we're making sure everything is on uh, USB and it will be held, uh, you know, after my retirement, after the next person's retirement, whatever, it will be held in our departmental library on a USB. So if someone gets interested in it, there it is. If for some reason the, the website disappears, whatever, we still have the data uh, and images and so forth. And I think that's very important. Yeah. Well, it's funny, we've come full circle, Tom, in terms of preservation, because in the 1640s, it was all about the fear of oblivion and what will happen to this, this matter. So it's really about you know, preservation. How can we keep these cultural artifacts for posterity? So it is not, not, to, not to go back to my book, although um, you know, I could, of course, talk about that till the cows come home. But, um, but this, the, these questions of um, preserva pre preserving our, our, our cultural um, you know, inheritance is you know, it's just as relevant now as it was in the 1640s and 50s. It's just clearly a value for us. We see it. A lot of people don't, and they, they really never do until you take it away. Uh, and the things that we had taken away from us during the pandemic, at the early, the early days in particular, uh, I think that now there might be a heightened sense of cultural awareness uh, about what can be taken away so quickly. And the uh, even the quotidian, you know, day-to-day -day elements of our lives, you know, just walking down the street and saying hello to a neighbor, even if you don't like the person that much, they're, they're your neighbor, right? You know, it's nice to see you. Yeah, then, nice to you see know? you. Uh, what's going on back there? You know, your dog barks too much. You know, you take away the barking dog and the neighbor or whatever. Of course, I guess in the pandemic, the barking dog was still there. But uh, anyhow, you, you just uh, take these things out of life, out of day-to-day -day life, and then you realize just how important they are. And yeah, I guess you can get through your life just fine without Shakespeare, without uh, a lot of the stuff that we study, uh, but uh, it's so enriching for so many people. And uh, that's where I kind of want to move. I have a couple of questions for you about this last age that uh, stuck in my mind. And so selfishly, uh, I see this coming up even as late as the early 19th century. They talk about the prior age. And uh, I, I, I wondered when I was reading exactly what are they talking? I think they're talking about the Shakespearean period or what they would see as the uh, old drama, that period before the war, right? Mm -hmm. The last mm -hmm. age. And that stuck for over, well over 100 years, you know, 150 easily. And uh, Dodsley and is coming out, you know, let's say turn of 19th century, whatnot, coming out with his old plays and old plays when paper got cheaper, just, just huge, just, I mean, additions and additions. And Shakespeare is prioritized in terms of single editions, but uh, within this whole flood of dramatists of the, of the last age or the old drama, it stuck. It's funny you use the word flood, Tom, because actually um, there was a, um, a running sort of metaphor in the Restoration that Shakespeare and his contemporaries were giants before the flood. And the flood, you can think of it as a sort of cataclysmic division. The flood was the, the Civil War. Um, yeah. But you think of the sort of antediluvian period where you know, before Noah, things were different. Um, yeah. But there was a sort of similar sense in the Restoration that before the, before the Civil War, 
um, you know, these people were sort of different, almost a different species. People like Shakespeare and Johnson, they were sort of giants and of, of culture. They wrote a different, you know, they, they spoke in a different way. Their plays sounded different. Um, the performance tradition was different. Um, so there was a sense of something being sort of alien and removed from the restoration, um, but also very important. So these sort of, they were giants, they were titans of the field. And they were doing, um, you know, there was a great admiration, but there's always a sense that, a sense of sort of removal of what they were doing. And I think that sort of carries through. And Dodsley, that phrase, old play, that's a, that's a word, um, oldness is a really important concept to my book, um, because very, you know, pretty early on, around the late 1640s, you get the sense of plays that weren't, you know, particularly chronologically old, um, you know, they may be 10 years old, um, they were being grouped in with plays that were produced 100 years prior. So you yeah. get this sort of sense of um, you know, this watershed moment of the Civil War and the closure of the theaters and everything produced before that, which previously would be sort of striated. You know, James Shirley um, in the Caroline period, James Th Shirley didn't think of himself as a contemporary of Shakespeare, right? There was, oh. you know, 30 years dividing them. Um, but from the Restoration, James Shirley and Shakespeare, or in the 1640s even, James Shirley is mentioned in the same breath as Shakespeare, as someone belonging to a period before. So you get this sort of great, you know, what was before thought as a great variety of uh, drama. You know, Elizabethan drama is different from Caroline drama, and Tudor plays are different from uh, Jacobean plays. Um, but after the theaters close, it's all sort of sort of swooshed into one, um, you know, sort of, it coalesces into one um, sort of singular category, which we now call early modern drama. Uh, now they didn't use the phrase early modern drama in the 17th century, but they did use old plays old uh, and they use it repeatedly. And that's a phrase that you see, um, you know, it's pretty consistently applied to plays before 1642. And it becomes sort of a category in its own right. And it's a category that's intelligible. And that is, you know, something that's used by Robert Dodsley or you know, the category sort of sticks um, and, so it's sort of interesting to think of, you know, oldness as, in some ways, if you think of it as sort of a nebulous category, like, oh, what's, you know, is this old or is that old? Um, but certainly it's a phrase that's consistently applied to plays uh, performed before 1642. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you're doing this uh, with without an archive, you... I mean, without the archive, the, the actual... Um, uh, physical archive where this the where the books are right you you don't have much to go on uh there uh you you need that for your research which is something i love about the, this type of research you need the archive and in your case i think the folger uh was very important uh other archival holdings what uh did you get over to the bodleian or were there other uh places that were of particular value in your research well, the Folger really was, um, you know, incredibly generous. I had a year of fellowship, uh, long-term fellowship at the Folger, and it was um, from uh, 2018 to 2019, which in retrospect, you know, it was sort of before the flood of COVID, right? Yeah. And it was such a wonderful year. Um, you know, there was so many wonderful people there who I got to uh, collaborate, you know, have lunch with, have coffee with, just, you know, work together with. And it was really such a wonderful um, year sort of intellectually and socially and it was really vibrant um so the Folger was a wonderful place to work I also had the um the privilege to work at the Huntington Library in California and that, I mean that's paradise you have the beautiful gardens uh you know wonderful staff wonderful people um it is it's such a fantastic place to work so working with the early material there um and then I was at the Newberry as well working on di with different material or different on a slightly different project a lot while I was there I still had to take some material out from the 1640s and 50s, just, just to have a peek, even though I was working on um, my second book project um, yes. on, on rags uh, and rag pickers and textual um, you know, textual culture. Um, but certainly I did, um, I was I was very fortunate to be, be able to um, go into these um, archives and be supported by these fellowships. So I really have to thank the Huntington and the Newberry and, and especially the Folger. Uh, just wonderful that that uh, exists out there uh, for scholars, particularly uh, early career. Uh, in that case, uh, you may not think of yourself now as so much early career as um, heading in more mid-career. Uh, I still see you as early career. Uh, and uh, maybe- Oh, that's good. That's good. Still have yeah. a, few, uh, a few tricks up my sleeve, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you are uh, now at the University of Toronto. And you have, uh, I believe, the uh, local, the, you have Fort Book over there. Uh, which I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting. I'm, the it's just 
incredible uh, visual of approaching the uh, U of T library, uh, which is uh, also a, a place with an astounding collection there. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not jealous as much as uh, uh, just, you know, I'm grateful that somebody thought to do that. And uh, so there you have it. Well, I'm, you have a, another friend in Toronto, Tom. So certainly if you want to ever want to come down and you know, over to Robart's library or to the Thomas Fisher and uh, enjoy an, an afternoon at Ford book, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, I, it, you will be there. Yeah, I'll have yeah, somebody there. Whether I spoke with Holger, we were talking uh, uh, before about that. And uh, uh, Holger Syme, who's a friend of the program. There are a lot of people whose names have come up. And there's so many more people, Heidi, I want to talk to, uh, you know, there's, we have limited resources. And so it's, um, you know, it's, um, there's, there's a little bit of a sadness because you just see, I, I'm thinking that you, you did this, you know, with your, your morbid chapter titles, you know, it's got kind of, uh, there was a sadness because I, you had a list of names not in your acknowledgements and I'd go through and I would just think, Oh my goodness, the people that I would love to, you know, I, I wish I could do this every day, you know. I don't. I don't know if I could get through the reading, but uh, the, let them tell us, you know. But there's so many people out there that have worked. Uh, you just showed a, a, an enormous network of people who are involved in this kind of stuff in your acknowledgments. And it really, I was. People were so generous with me um, when I was at the Folger and the Huntington. I was relatively junior. I um, mean, you know, I had just come out of my PhD program, and people really took the time to. Um, you know, sit down with me. They didn't, you know, I wasn't, didn't have a position. I wasn't established, but people were so generous with their time and with their ideas just to, you know, take me up for a coffee or, and they often did, you know, buy me my coffee or my lunch and, and just share their, their time and their expertise with me. Um, and so those, those are the people I really, um, you know, whose, whose expertise and whose um, academic gen generosity um, has really sort of made me the scholar I am. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them. And you're part of that too, Tom, you've been so you know, so, so wonderful, inviting me to these programs. And we had our, um, you know, the Digitizing the Stage conferences at the Bodleian um, in 2017 and 2019. Um, so you're you're part of that too, Tom. You're, you know, I have to thank you as well, certainly. Well, the, yeah, uh, but I feel sort of humbled by some of the names in your acknowledgement list. You know, there's some uh, extraordinary people in there, uh, all of them really, uh, but uh, some people who have passed on now. You know, you're talking about Harry Berger, uh, and uh, Sonia made it abundantly clear how much influence uh, he had on her career. You know, you take this where you were talking about being contentious, but this younger, uh, contentious Italian woman who comes in and disagrees at a, a conference. And instead of being exiled, you know, taken under the wing of a senior scholar at that time and guided and uh, so forth, it seems that you're talking about the same sort of mentorship. Uh, that, uh, you know, we, we talk about all, all kinds of things. People bicker with each other. You know, there are a lot of family arguments and so forth, but there's an enormous amount of mentorship and uh, your case brings this out. Uh, and that's absolutely, really, absolutely. Uh, uh, really good that these uh, people do take their time and you would think they wouldn't, but they do. Uh, they do, they do. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned, I mean, I've had some mentors who have, you know, passed on, you know, at the University of Toronto, uh, at the University of St. Andrews, I worked with Barbara Murray, who worked on restoration adaptation of Shakespeare. And she was really crucial to um, making me realize that there was this sort of, um, you know, after lives of Shakespeare after, you know, after 1616 or after 1623. Um, so she, you know, she worked in the 1660s and, and you know, various adaptations of, of Shakespeare, William Davenant and so forth. Um, I know with her, without her, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be wouldn't be on this path. So, you know, various mentors who have, um, you know, whether they are still on this astral plane or who have shuffled off this mortal co coil, I'm certainly very very grateful to them. And, uh, yeah, uh, to them, it's a sad. Here or not? <laughs> yeah, there's just some people you just feel should just live forever. You know, uh, then uh, there is a kind of sadness there, but then again, there's also some uh, happiness in uh, the fact that we are uh, we have survived this i mean there the people have been uh trying to kill off the humanities I, uh one of uh, my podcasts is dedicated to that for decades now you know just globally kill it off I, you know there there's i i don't think this is a puritanical thing it's more of a utilitarian i think uh, mm -hmm. uh movement you know as as we moved into academe then the, the uh question it seems perennial comes up why do we need those folks over there 
And, uh, you know, and then again, if you just wipe it out the next day, people are going, what did you do that for? I mean, we, we like that, uh, you know, you know, the, uh, yeah, maybe our son and uh, or daughter or whatever is not going to study Shakespeare at this university, but we like the idea that this university has Shakespeare. You know, right? Even, even though, uh, I think there's, you know, there's things like there's Chat GBT, I suppose, um, but Chat GBT isn't particularly good at writing interesting things or beautifully. It can write a grammatical sentence, but it can't think interesting thoughts. Um, and it will be, you know, it's good maybe crafting code or various things. Um, but really, humans are the best at writing beautiful you know, poetry and wonderful essays. And I don't think we'll be replaced um, you know, replaced by AI anytime soon. So in terms of utilitarian, I think the humanities will, will run out eventually. <laughs> yeah, they, we always do, you know, uh, after, you know, just keep crawling out from under that rock they try to throw us <laughs> under. Uh, but, well, um, I want to find out a little bit before we end this. I want to uh, find out a little bit about what is next. Now, what is next is obviously your uh, digital work. Uh, and uh, you're in Canada now, um, but you are still, uh, that doesn't change. In fact, it might open up some opportunities, some funding opportunities and so forth. Uh, there are some very uh, excellent funding sources in Canada, I know from Janelle. And uh, also uh, uh, elsewhere, too, because you need the funding to keep these things going. Uh, it's just impossible without it. Well, my next project will probably be um, highly archival as well, having been out of the archive, the physical archive during during COVID. Um, but my next project I'm really interested in will actually most likely be a trans historical project. So starting in the early modern period, but also looking a little bit earlier and especially a little bit later, probably up to our own contemporary moment. Um, so this project looks at rags and rag collection and waste picking as the raw material for cultural um, you know, cultural production. So it really started with um, looking at rag pickers. And these are the individuals who, uh, before the invention of wood pulp paper, when paper was made out of linen rags, would have to collect the old used rags, um, you know, door to door or rags that people had thrown away, collect these old, you know, really worn out, disgusting rags, bring them to the, and bring them to the paper mill to be processed into paper on which you know, the great plays and poems and, and prose works of our, of our culture were printed. Um, so they would, if you want printing uh, paper for writing or printing, you have to have rags and they have to be collected by these individuals. Um, so that is sort of my starting point. Um, and now it seems like I'm thinking more about um, sort of waste collection and its relationship to cultural, um, you know, cultural production. Like now you have, um, there's a band called Co 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 um, out of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they produce uh, music on uh, on instruments that they have just gathered out of the uh, scrapyard and for some garbage stuffs. So it's just sort of the idea of you know out of the trash that we generate, and some of it is tr generated in the global north and the center of the global south, where they have to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, sort of art is generated out of that by. You know, people who collect it themselves. So it's thinking of sort of the waste picker or the rag picker is my key figure, um, and out of that I'm sort of sort of branch out uh, in various ways um, to to see where I'll end up. But certainly, a key part of it will be the early modern rag picker because that is where I, the project started. Um, but what's sort of interesting, again, thinking sort of paradoxically, I like things that are sort of contrarian. Um, is the idea that you know Shakespeare's first folio, this incredible, important, expensive work of art, was generated out of the you know, dirty old rags that had been thrown away uh, and collected by someone who, you know, who, who didn't have a very high social status. So that's sort of idea, the combination of high and low. So that's my, that's my next project. Yeah. It went from, um, it, it, you know, just, I'm thinking of Hamlet's idea of the guts, guts of a beggar, you know, right. Yes. Past a King passes through the guts of a beggar or whatever, this cycle of, um, of things, uh, the I was reading uh, Andrew Pedigree. So speaking of St. Andrews, uh, Andrew Pedigree's book uh, with his graduate student, whose name I, I will mispronounce, uh, uh, both, of course, brilliant uh, scholars, but the uh, on the library, the history the fragile history of the library. Um, and at one point uh, was coming across the transition from uh, parchment to rags uh, in the um, I don't know, where are we uh, 16th, early 16th, late 15th? Where are we getting into rags? Uh, you do have rag collection even in the medieval period. Um, okay. In the um, 
certainly there's a there's an account of a um, uh, a, 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 a rag collect sort of a, a paper mill and that involved rags in the um, in the 14th century. Um, so I'm not sure actually when it, uh, when it exactly starts, but certainly I, have, I haven't started my, my cut up date so far as the medieval period, so I haven't really gone before that. But that's a good question. I should be able to answer that. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, it, there's it's a, it's mysterious, uh, and we can I mean very safely point to a. Uh, a time in which parchment just was not now by parchment for my students, we're talking about animal skins and that's, mm -hmm. you know, not only do you have to kill animals to get their skins, you uh, it's expensive, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, the old joke about the, I, I think it's my joke actually about the sheep nervously <laughs> on the side of the hill, wondering when Aquinas is going to finish his summa. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the rumor that there's another volume out there has everybody, you know, just absolutely uh, stressed out. Uh, uh, <laughs> but anyway, when you change the rags, you get away from the animal. So it is cheaper, but it isn't completely cheap because the rags Still are labor intensive, very expensive. And so, yeah, if you can um, recycle the old clothing and you talk about the women who did this in uh, one of your articles, uh, just right, yes. br brilliant stuff. And there are some YouTube videos where people try to do this. Uh, I'm not sure about um, rags. I know that parchment, they're showing uh, how you stretch it and dry it. And uh, it's a, a long kind of tedious process. But these parchment, I'm sorry, these um, rag pages hold up pretty well. Now that we're, they you know, do. they do. Here the first folio. We're seeing how well things have held up. Uh and um, uh, yeah, there's such a there's such a history there, and that's going to put you in. Yeah, <laughs> you're back in the archive. Uh, I'm, it's still early days, but I'm still I'm excited to be to see where this project goes. But it does seem like it in order to tell the story, I'll have to jump out of the early modern period a little bit, and that will be that will be exciting if daunting. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, then in closing, uh, Heidi, uh, let's see, I want to uh, make sure our viewers know that you are a new faculty member at the University of Toronto, where you did your uh, PhD work. Uh, and, uh, and you're back home in a way that you are a, uh, you're a child of Montreal, but uh, yes. very much also a uh, a uh, uh, Torontan, do we, we're Torontan? Torontonian. <laughs> Torontonian. Uh, and uh, I'm just so happy that you are are there. My uh, my son is trying to get the visa worked out and so forth. You, you've faced this recently, and I know, uh, in your American expeditions and so forth. But uh, he's uh, uh, about to marry a uh, Torontonian. Uh, oh, exciting. Who, yeah, he uh, he met in college, and uh, so they're trying to work out the visa thing, and um, and they will. Uh, they're both very capable uh, people, and so uh, I will be. I will see you. I will see you, and I will oh, see. I will see uh, Holger Syem, our our friend friend of our program, and others. Uh, so so many good people uh, at uh, University of Toronto, and of course all around at McGill. Uh, of course, uh, we we just uh, had Steve uh, Wittick on our campus and uh, who uh, did his work at McGill. Uh, so I have a lot of fondness. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm grew up in the American South. And so can Canada was just this foreign country for us now. But it's just it feels like a second or third home for me now. Uh, Absolutely. With you have lots of lots of friends here in Canada. Yeah. And that's exciting when you come when you come to visit. We'll have to have a good uh, have to have a big get together. Yeah, well, I I may have missed you. I went to the RSA in Toronto some years, uh, maybe 2018 or 19. Oh yes, I was I I was there. Yes. Well, I didn't really know you then. Uh, that was yes, that's true. That was before. Uh, that was before, before we knew each other. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I that's right because it was before the digital, and. Um, and so my wife and I were there and we had a few extra days, you know, you want to go out and see. So we went to Niagara. Now it was still cold. Beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. It was just, she loved it. I thought it would be a little bit, you know, Niagara, uh, you know, it's a sort of American, uh, sometimes made to look like kitsch, uh, but at just the falls, you can't beat them, you know. And they're spectacular. They, they, they are, are spectacular. And we had a, a wonderful time. And we went up to, um, we drove around a little bit and went to Niagara on the lake, that little town, 
there, which was very charming. It was very cold. And I had a rental car and this Canadian fellow and his wife, uh, I parked and he was standing on the sidewalk and he said, how do you like that car? Uh, because he was thinking of buying, I said, well, it's a rental. And if it were not a rental, you could drive it around and, but please you know, have a seat. <laughs> anyway, we got to talking and he was Canadian, his wife, and he graduated from the university of Tennessee. And he found oh, out funny. in our conversation, you know, that I was uh, from South Carolina. And he said, I'm trying to go back and visit because I had a wonderful time when I was in Knoxville and I had a wonderful time in college. And he was about my age. And his wife said, no way. And my like, no way are you taking me down there. <laughs> Just for a little visit? I mean... <laughs> no. no. And, I, and he and I were kind of pleading, saying, no, it's not as bad as people make it out. Make it oh, out it's lovely. Me. Oh, it's yeah. wonderful. It's really wonderful parts. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's no um I hope yeah. she was convinced. She would have an excellent, excellent visit if, if uh, she made it down there. Well, I've been trying in my life to improve the image of my my home turf, and uh, it's just uh, every now and then something makes national news that uh, brings us down again. You know, somebody does something stupid. You're doing a good job, Tom. You're doing it. Uh, <laughs> you're representing very well. Well, I'll, I'll try, and uh, uh, we have uh, that. So any, anyhow, Heidi, uh, you're not going to be a stranger. I hope I can keep this going. I don't know how long I can keep it going, but I hope I can keep it going long enough to where we could have you back uh, after your next big project comes out. I would love to do a program on the digital stuff uh, out of uh, University of Victoria and that that particular. I really want to see that thing uh, get better and better. And I think that's the course it's on right now. Oh, that would be wonderful. That would be, that would be such an honor to be here for a third time. Tom. I'm, second time was already such a privilege, but that would be, that'd be fantastic. I, anytime well, you want to speak, I'm, I, I'm, I'm certainly keen. When we have you on, we're having a lot of other people on uh, from the 17th century. This program we're uh, bringing, uh, uh, we're collaborating with uh, the dead and, uh, but uh, not forgotten. And um, partially because of your work, uh, largely, I think, in some cases, because of your work. And we're collaborating with the very much the quick, uh, uh, the, the people you have, have acknowledged and have helped you and so forth. So if I can't speak with anyone, then I hope that I'm communicating somehow by proxy with those people. <laughs> but it is it has been our pleasure. If I could ask you to stay just a moment after we finish and debrief just a bit. But thank you again so much, Heidi. I'm sure that our viewers and listeners will be absolutely um, just um, uh, wowed by the work that you have been able to do in, in uh, your career thus far. Thank you so much. Thank you. My thanks are all due to you, Tom. It's been so, so fun, as always, to speak with you and really, really, really a great, great afternoon uh, or morning for you as a case may be. But it's always, um, really, always very illuminating and, and very enjoyable to speak with you. So thank you for having me.